All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're doing good today? Yes. Yeah, doing good. Okay, so just a couple of things uh, to touch on. Our ministry schedules, a uh, fairly regular uh, Sunday night and Wednesday night schedule this week. Um, on Sunday nights at 5.30, right now, we, we just a couple of weeks ago finished up a separate men's and women's study, and those were good. We've come back together. We're meeting in the um, sanctuary at 530. And, and I want to tell you, I'm just, you know, just to be straight up, uh, we are learning to pray together. We, we are praying, not talking about praying. We are just learning what it's like to really pray together, not to have somebody on stage pray while we're listening, but to give ourselves that moment. I'm not sure what it's going to look like, uh, but it's a great thing. The disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And, of course, what follows after that is the Lord's Prayer. Um, but we're really looking at that. We looked at it last week. Lord, teach us to pray, to pray together as your people. And um, what might happen if, if we as a people really learn to start praying together? There's this thing called the Moravian um, Prayer Experience that's an incredible thing. A prayer meeting, in case this, if you never Googled it, research that you ought to is a prayer meeting that began with a 24-hour um, prayer vigil and then it lasted 24 hours a day three people at each time slot for 110 years 
110 years. And the number of missionaries they sent out, the number of people that got saved during that, is, is, you really can't calculate it. It's just an amazing story. So that's kind of what the adults are doing to get us up to summertime, and we'll go from there. Uh, this past Thursday night, we had uh, a tune-up, marriage tune-up. That's a pretty cool thing. We had 38 couples here, 19, 19 couples, 38 people. Jeff Ford and his wife were here uh, to pour into our married couples. We're going to, that's something we're going to kind of be doing maybe four times a year, just a uh, one and a half to two hour event, get together, talk about marriage, what does it look like uh, from all kind of different angles, bringing in people to share uh, godly wisdom with us and I hope that uh, maybe next time uh, you hear about that, you, you and your spouse uh, might also want to participate. And I will say that together a lot of people have been asking for you, so you they're just all over the place here. One of them sitting right down here in the front. Hey, Liam, Gail's here. She's back there. Miss Gail. Okay, so um, any other announcements need to be made? Any, anybody needs to make an announcement about anything at all? Okay, there's a really cool thing happening that's coming up Saturday, and many of you have already kind of participated by way of cleaning out and finding stuff that's of good value and usable for our community share day. Basically, a yard sale that's free. That for people to come, man, if there's something you need and you see it, take it. And I brought my, uh, I, I think I shared last week maybe in one of the services that I got to looking around my stuff. I had three perfectly good set of hedge trimmers, electric hedge trimmer. I don't know why. I have three. But I don't have a three anymore. I only have one. And the other two are on the trailer out there to go. Just stuff like that. And um, so I know Trey is here. Where's Trey? Yeah, and Emmy. Come on up. Oop, got to get you all a microphone. Now, you're not getting my headset, girl. <laughs> I know I would never get that thing back. And look at Jeff. He's smart. He's putting the microphone in Trey's hand. See, we, we, we got you figured out. All right, talk to us. Tell us what we need to know. All right, so few changes that have been made since we've been announcing it. Um, with all the stuff we've been getting, we've been getting a lot of good stuff so far from a bunch of the churches. So we're going to do a drop-off on Tuesday at 6, as it says up there. Um, but the actual putting together care packages and things of that nature is going to be Thursday. And we're actually going to do that at 5. Um, and Thursday, we're going to do a few more different things. So we actually got sign-up sheets back there for everyone. We're going to do a cleaning crew because we've definitely got some things that could use a little bit of cleanup and a little bit of organization. So we're going to have a cleanup crew, an organization crew, and then a care package crew. Um, so we're going to do that starting at 5 on Thursday. We're still going to do drop-offs as well on Thursday because, again, we we're just getting so much stuff. The, uh, the trailer out there was loaded down last Tuesday, and I have a feeling it may be pretty loaded right now. Um, so we're going to do all that Thursday at 5. So if you want to come and help on any of that, we will have sign-up sheets back there for that. And we also put a sign-up sheet back there for the trucks on Saturday. Um, so if you have a truck, have a trailer, and want to come out and help move stuff and get things to people's houses, um, those that may need it, um, please sign up back there as well. Okay, so Thursday, if somebody wants to help with all that, they come to the JC Barn at 5 p.m. And we'll stay there until we're done. There you go. <laughs> But we're, we're expecting a lot of help, so don't think it'd be more than a couple hours of your time, and would be greatly appreciated. So if we do a little math there, uh, two hours deducting the more the, the more volunteers we have, mm -hmm. the quicker it goes. There you go. The less time we spend out there. I was talking to somebody earlier this week, and they were kind of uh, they had something on Saturday. They weren't going to be able to be here Saturday. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, I, I think that's okay. But here's the thing: you can come on Thursday yes. and uh, help on that end. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be a great thing. So maybe you're one of those that you have something already on Saturday. You can't be there. Come out Thursday. Uh, but hopefully you can come both, Thursday and Saturday. Yeah, and we'll say if you're coming out Saturday, obviously the event is going to start at 9, but I can imagine we'll definitely need some help getting stuff set up. Um, if weather looks good, we're definitely going to be out on that front lawn in the J.C. Barn. So we'll probably need some help getting some stuff out of the building and getting it set up and getting tables set up, clothes put on tables, stuff like that. So maybe... I don't know, probably 7, 7 o'clock on Saturday if you're able to come a little early and help out. And if not, just come and volunteer and talk to people and spread the word. That's a big thing on Saturday as people just come as they're walking around to be there, to have conversations. Just have conversations with people. Talk to them about what's going on and, 
And uh, you might have opportunity to pray with somebody, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody. Maybe somebody will say, why, why are y'all doing this? And that, that's like an open door out there. You're not, yeah. Well, okay, because this is who we are as people of God. This is what we think he would have us to do. Yeah, and a couple other things. Um, Mount, we're doing it with Mount Calvary, Ruth, Lakeview, Limestone Church. Um, we all had talked about having some music there. So there's actually going to be a band set up as well, playing some music, just giving some background noise. Um, so that will be something fun. And then also, we were actually throwing the idea out there, and we haven't hammered this out fully, but of actually having a person walk with each family. So when a family shows up, we have a volunteer that walks around with them, kind of learns more about them, and kind of guides them through a little bit um, to really kind of hammer, hammer home the uh, intentional conversation. So some things that if that's stuff you're willing to do and you want to be a part of that, uh, please let us know. Any questions? Anybody have a question about, about this? It's a pretty big event. First time this many churches have, have joined in to do this. And uh, I think it's a really cool thing. It's really not done under any one church's name. This is under the uh, banner of the kingdom of God and his people. And uh, it's a really pretty powerful moment. A anything at all? I think that's a great idea, um, for sure. Yeah, absolutely, and we can get a table set up for that, and we'll send out text to the other churches. No, absolutely, we love that. So. I thought about, you know, I know you can't do that early, but I wonder, I think we thought about that. No, that's a great idea, great idea. We do ask for all the non-perishable stuff. If you go ahead and make sure that's here at the church by, like, 4 p.m. on Thursday, so that we can for sure have everything we're going to have for the care packages. But then if we have an option to throw some fresh stuff in there on Saturday, that's a good idea. So the trailer is until 4, but if you want to bring something directly to the J.C. Barn at 6 on Tuesday or from 5 to 7 probably on Thursday, um, we'll be there. I, I'd say definitely Tuesday, get there close to 6 as you can. Um, yeah, in Texas for sure, or, and let us know if you're going to be bringing something. Um, I don't know if we have our numbers anywhere yet. It is? Okay, it's on the other slide. Um, and we can write it over there if we need to. But, yes, yeah, so you can bring it directly to the J.C. Barn if that's a little bit easier because, again, I think that trailer is pretty full or will be. Any others? Hey, so is it David Crowder and his band that are going to be playing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Yep. Huh? Crowder. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. That's good. Anything else? Well, here we go. We're down to the last uh, less than a week. Yeah. Till this thing happens. And there's a lot of stuff there at the barn already. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. All right. Thank you all. Thank you all. So very much. <clears throat> go give that to Jeff. So there you go. What an opportunity, uh, both with your hands and feet, but also with your heart to share out of the goodness that uh, God has blessed all of us in this room with and those online. If you're online watching, um, you, you're invited. I hope you understand that, to uh, bring stuff to, uh, to this share day and to be a part of that as well. Let's pray together, and then we're going to start singing some songs of worship. Father God, we bow before you, and we have not come into this room to worship you because we're worthy. Father, we come humbly into this room knowing that we have been made worthy only through the blood of Jesus Christ who died for us on Calvary. Father, we have all stumbled somewhere in our faith, maybe even on this very day, in our thoughts, our actions, our words, our relationships. Father, we don't come to present ourselves as a perfect people to you would come as saved sinners who are, are, are wanting to learn more about what it means to walk in grace. And so, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would, by your Holy Spirit, bring freedom into this room, freedom to worship from our heart. Father, free our minds to hear your word and receive it, to, to allow you to implant it in us, graft it into our souls. Father, may this, may this entire moment on this street corner right here in Cochrane, uh, may it bring you pleasure. 
And this ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good. Y'all ready to worship? Come on, y'all stand on y'all's feet and worship with us this morning.
Faithful through generations 
Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace.
Father, we recognize uh, right now that we are we are truly powerless. Uh, you give us uh, what little power we have and what little um, comfort, stability, and uh, just perspective that we may have. It comes through you, uh, and we praise you for that this morning. Uh, you are our Father. Uh, you are our rock, and I pray that your church would just lean on you in everything, not just when we're here Sundays and Wednesdays, but that uh, as we approach our world, as we encounter non-believers, as we encounter uh, maybe stagnant believers, that we would uh, be your voice, that we would be your, uh, your prodding, and we would be your uh, hands and feet. Uh, do a work in our church towards that end, and be with PK as he comes and just guides us in your word. And it's just in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless us with some great musicians oh and vocalists up here, yes? And a pretty cool thing, I, I, I think most everybody's aware of this, but just in case you're not, uh, it's kind of fun to watch from week to week, uh, the composition of who's up here. If you notice, it changes every week, you know, different ones. But like today, Caleb was up here. Caleb was one of our Middle Georgia, um, uh, Middle Georgia State University students uh, who was on guitar and doing vocals. Didn't Caleb do a good job? Yeah. <laughs> Um, Caleb's real active down here in the BCM. Also up here, and this is the first time that I can remember where Nina Beth yes. was the lead vocalist. How about that? And of course, Nina Beth is one who came up uh, through the student children's and student ministries of our church. She's now also a student at Middle Georgia State University and is serving our church as our student intern. And, and one of her primary responsibilities is oversight of the youth praise and worship team that leads worship on Wednesday nights over here at the summit. So I just think that's really cool um, that uh, along with some of the faces that we're familiar with, uh, some that we, uh, we get to share with. So that's a cool thing. All right. Get your Bible out. Uh, we are going to, uh, we're, we're going to break down one verse today. But we've got to read some verses to get to the one verse that I want to break down. And, and so, uh, as you're turning to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, that's the chapter we're going to be in, uh, I want to make sure that uh, what God's kind of put on my heart as far as what we're going to talk about today from his word uh, is applicable to at least some of us in here. Is anybody in here, I'm going to go ahead and raise my hand. I want you to know my answer to the question is yes, I have. But I'm wondering, is anybody else in here ever messed up? Just Okay, there's about 10 of you in here that haven't, but the rest of us, uh, pray for those 10 because they just, they just don't understand yet how messed up they really are. So, uh, we, we all recognize what it's like to mess up, not just in little ways, but in big ways. And uh, even though we call the name of Jesus Christ and we say that we're a follower of Jesus Christ, and, and if somebody asks us, we might even say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, uh, at the same time, we look in the mirror uh, of our quiet time and we realize that we struggle, we, we stumble, we fall. And um, so I think it's good to get some wisdom from Scripture on how, how do we deal with that and how do we think about it. So we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now I'm going to read, okay, um, straight through verse 12. Okay, I'm going to make a commitment to you right now. I'm not going to stop once I start reading. All 12 of those verses, I'm just going to read them. They're background verses. That's why I'm saying all this now so I can read them without having to stop. He is referencing, okay, God is referencing through Paul, who is his instrument for writing this letter to the church at Corinth. He is referencing what God's people went through after they came out of Egypt. If you're here on Wednesday nights, we're studying this. As a matter of fact, he's referencing what we studied this past week, and we'll study again this next week. The whole deal where they, they came out, they saw God's glory, they saw his power, his deliverance, his provision, all these incredible things, and yet they get right there to the bottom of the mountain. Moses is up there getting the Ten Commandments. They're down there and decide to have a party. They make a golden calf. 
is, it was a bad scene. In spite of all they had seen of the faithfulness of God. That's, that's what he's referencing here. So let's jump in. Verse 1. For I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in, in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, verse 12, that anyone who thinks that he stands, take heed lest he fall. So there's the first warning. If you're somebody here this morning and you feel like you've got it all together and that in your spiritual maturity you've arrived and that your point of view is always the right point of view and your interpretation of Scripture is always the right interpretation of Scripture, my friends, you are in grave danger. You need to be aware. The Bible says that pride goes just right before a fall. That's what he's saying. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And then we come to verse 13. And verse 13 is the verse we're going to break down. Okay? So if you're a note-taking kind of person, you're going to want to maybe, maybe take some notes here. Um, if you're one of the Sunday morning nappers that like to nap during the, the main part of the sermon, now would be a good time to doze off because I'm going to be on this one verse for a little while. Okay? Verse 13. No one, let me say this about this verse. Uh, there are a lot of verses in Scripture that I would highly recommend uh, you memorize. Okay? You, you cannot memorize too much Scripture. Okay, for all of you 30 and older who are saying, I can't memorize stuff anymore. Yes, you can. You can. You got to work at it. You got to work at it. But the more you work at it, the more you realize how God blesses that, and you actually are uh, hiding God's Word in your heart uh, that will keep you from sinning against Him. Verse 13 is one of those verses I would highly recommend you memorize. I memorized it probably when I was in my early 20s. And I cannot tell you how many times I've had to quote it in, in, in terms of things that I was facing in my life. This is an incredible verse. It's an incredible promise. But we've got to really, really understand what's going on here in this verse. So we're going to break it down. Okay, is everybody with me? Verse 13. Here we go. I'm going to read straight through the verse. Then we're going to go back and read through and break it down. Everybody with me? Okay. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Powerful verse. For any of you in here who have ever stumbled in your walk with Christ, who have ever sinned, even though you knew, you knew without a doubt that what you were getting ready to do, think, participate in was wrong, if you, whatever it is, if, if you have ever messed up, and all but 10 of us in here have, you need to really focus on this verse right here and the truth of it. Okay, so we're going back up to the, to the start of verse 13. Hang with me. Very first thing, no temptation. I want to talk about that word temptation just real quick, okay? Um, comes from a Greek word, parasmos. And that word has different shades of meaning, and, and they can all fit right here. There's the idea of uh, parasmos of, of uh, a trial, uh, making a trial of or, or trying something or putting something to the test. There's also the idea of being tempted. It, it's a word that can refer to the trial of one's character or the trial of one's virtue, but it also can apply to solicitation to sin. Now, I want you to listen, okay? Temptation to sin always comes from Satan. You got to understand that, okay? Now, God will allow testing and temptation that Satan brings our way. He will allow that, okay? But his purposes in that, in that are not to, to cause us to sin, but God wants to use that, those moments of temptation, those times of temptation, that he can help us escape, that's what we're going to get to, to deepen us, to deepen our character, to strengthen us in our faith, okay? 
So there are trials that God allows into our life, and sometimes even times of testing and trial that God will bring into our life for the purpose of deepening our faith. Everything that comes from Satan into your life is a temptation to sin in order to hurt your witness, in order to cast seeds of doubt into, your, into whether or not you think you're really saved, and, and, and to draw you away from God. So in the context of this verse, I think the primary context has to do with the temptations that come our way that are evil in nature, those things which would draw us away from God, draw us away from the intimacy that we have with God, okay, and, uh, and injure us, wound us in, in our hearts and our souls. So there is no temptation, second, the second part of this verse, that has overtaken you that is not common to man. Now, some of you are, are some of you, are, I'm afraid of facing get your feelings hurt, okay? But don't leave. Just hang in there. According to Psalm 139, every single one of you in this room is remarkably and wonderfully made. Yes? And that's right. I mean, God was knitting you together in the womb. He, he made you on purpose and, and for a purpose. You've heard me say that before. Okay? You are remarkably and wonderfully made. But I need you to understand something, brother and sister. Your life experiences are very common. You see, one of the things going on in our culture right now, in our society, is you've got a whole bunch of people that like to think that what's happening to them is unique to them. And that nobody's ever been through what I've been through. And nobody can understand what I'm feeling because nobody's ever been through what I've been through. And if you're sitting here and you're one of those people, I want to tell you, I'm sorry, there are a lot of people that have been through whatever it is you're going through. No, they haven't. Yes, they have. No temptation, no trial has overcome you, but such as is common to man. The writer of Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing happening to you that's absolutely unique to you. Okay? So, yes, you are remarkably and wonderfully made. God has made you beautifully, uniquely. And it's for a very unique purpose that you can only discover in relationship with him through Jesus Christ. But as you walk through life, the things you experience, especially those times of struggle, those times when you fail, when you mess up, those are, not, those are not unique to you. They're common. And the reasons for your falling, they're common. Okay? That's why we need each other. We share our stories and we hear in our stories, hey, you've struggled with this. Or, or, or you can say, hey, I've struggled with this. Let me tell you what God taught me and back and forth because nothing is it's, it's, it's common to all of us. Okay? So there's no temptation, trial, putting to the test as overtaking you that is not common to man. Very next thing, we've got to park on this one for just a second. God is faithful. God is faithful. That is a statement right there. That is a fact. That is a truth of Scripture. And I want to tell you something. God is the only one of whom it can be said he is faithful. Always, always has been, is, always will be. You and I aren't faithful to God. We, 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 that's our heart's desire. We want to be, Yes. We want to be. But you know what? We're, st we're still trapped in these old simple bodies and that old simple nature that we've been freed from through Christ. It still whispers in our ear and it still gets our attention sometimes and we listen to it way more than we should. We're not as faithful to God. We get, uh, our passions get messed up sometimes. Anybody in here will be honest enough to say that there have been times in your life when you looked at your life or God helped you to look at your life and you realized I am more passionate about this than I am about God. Anybody ever been through a time like that in your life? Yeah, you just kind of look at it and you go, what? I had a good, uh, good friend of mine, still a good friend, but uh, don't ever see him anymore. He was in a former church, okay? And he was a deer hunter. Okay, I'm not talking about just a deer hunter. He was a ridiculously passionate deer hunter. And I mean, he was always looking for the, for the latest and greatest and for, for the advantages he could he could take and, you know, to get out there and his joy, his passion was in, in, in taking the big buck, you know, and of course he ate what he killed, but he was all about, I was all about that. I mean, it was like, you know, from the first Sunday after deer season came in until the first Sunday after deer season went out, he rarely was in church. Why? Yeah, he was in a different assembly. It's, it's called in nature. Sitting up high in a tree. And I would, I would say, Bert. I'd say, Bert, really? He said, dude, I have my Bible with me. I said, I said, yeah. I said, if you're in the middle of a scripture, 
And Mr. Big Buck walks by, are you going to finish that scripture before you shoot? Oh, no, no, I'm dropping that Bible. I said, yeah, there you go. What's your passion? What's up with that? We went back and forth and back and forth. And, uh, and, and we were great friends. We prayed together. He, and, and, and when it wasn't deer season, he was pretty passionate about Christ. It was just when deer season was here. But then it got to where even when it wasn't deer season, he was, all he would talk about was the coming up deer season. And, you know, I, I can remember one of the conversations. He came up one time. He said, hey, PK, come here. I, man, I just found this is amazing stuff. And he showed me. He said, this, this stuff, you just slather yourself in it when you, uh, before you go deer hunting. And uh, I said, what is it? He said, well, it, it's urine. I said, what? Yeah, and the deer, deer won't even smell you. I mean, you mean, they mean right there and you're sitting there and it just covers that human smell with an animal smell. It's the greatest stuff. And we're at church when he's telling me this about animal urine that he's going to be dousing himself in. It's in lotion porn, though, before he goes hunting when the up season, uh, upcoming deer season. I mean, it was crazy. But he really did love Jesus. And at some point in his life, God started dealing with him about that. He had a wife. He had three, three beautiful children. He was gone from them all those times he was deer hunting. He wasn't around in the mornings to help get ready for school and all that kind of stuff. His wife was a, a high school teacher. And there came a point in his life when uh, God convicted him. In my mind, Okay, so this one works just as good as, as this other one. But it's kind of like having a security blanket. At least I got some. Oh, there we go. Okay, so so God brought him to the point. He said, you know what? I, I should not have anything in my life that competes with my passion for Christ. I recognize that. Now, I want to tell you something. He didn't, he didn't do this thing, uh, okay, I, I'm going to make sure I leave the deer stand in time to get to church. He left deer hunting. He just left it. Walked away from it because he knew he would not be able to remain faithful if that was still a part of his life. Faithful to God, faithful to his passions in, 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 for Christ. He walked away. I don't know that he's been deer hunting a, a, a single time since. I want to tell you something. This, is a, this guy, Bert, was eat up with deer hunting, and he walked away just like that. By the power of God, he walked away because he knew he could not remain faithful or more faithful with that in his life. We all struggle with faithfulness to God. We let stuff get in our life that becomes as important or more important to us than our relationship with God. We struggle to be faithful. God is always faithful. Always. Always. If I could put it in the terms of, of a divorce court hearing, okay? God and you standing before the judge... And the judge looks at you because you're seeking the divorce from God and, 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 and says to you, okay, uh, 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 what are your reasons for des desiring this divorce? What, what has God done? Where has he been unfaithful? And you would have to stand there and look at that judge and say what? Oh, no, he's, God's been great. Great. His love is complete. His love is unconditional. His love is sacrificial towards me. He has always been faithful. Nothing, nothing has ever come between God and his love for me. And the judge is going to look at you and say, okay, well, why, well, well what about you? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm the one that's been unfaithful. I'm the one that keeps wandering away. I'm the one that feels shame in my life because I know about the love of God and I just struggle to return that because I wrestle with so much stuff. I have not been faithful. Then why do you want a divorce if, if you're the reason for it? Because I just don't feel worthy of this. And, and, and that's a crazy sounding dialogue, but that's kind of how it is. God is faithful or not. And yet we're the ones oftentimes that divorce ourselves, remove ourselves from the intimacy with God because we're convinced. Now listen to me. We're convinced that at some point, God finally looks at us and says, I'm, I'm done. I'm tired. I'm, you've come to me so many times asking forgiveness for that same thing, and no, that, that's it. God never does that. 
God's, God's grace, his forgiveness, it never runs dry because he is faithful. God is faithful. <coughs> you got to remember that, okay? Let's keep going back. Go back to verse 13. I want to make sure. Yeah, here we go. And because he's faithful, he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Now, we've got to focus in here. I know Sunday school's coming up. Do you really need to hear this? Because I think this is where we mess up a lot of times. We have this idea that God has put us out here into this world after saving us through Jesus Christ. We have this idea that God has put us out here in this world and he wants us to do the best that we can on our own. And if we ever get into a tight spot, if, it, if it ever get, the pressure gets too heavy, then we call on God and say, oh, I can't do this, God, can you, will you do it for me? That's not at all what we're called to do. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. That word translated ability comes from the root word dunamis, which is the word for power, strength, okay? If you go back to the book of Acts, Jesus instructed his disciples to remain in Jerusalem until what came? The power, the dunamis. And the dunamis arrived when the Holy Spirit arrived. So the power, the ability to withstand sin has been invested in us by the Holy Spirit of God. God is not asking you to try to live in holiness on your own strength. Let's take a quick poll real quick. How many of you feel like in your own strength you can handle the pressures and temptations of life? Raise your hand up. I'll give you a second. How many of you are willing to confess right now you absolutely know that if there is not a strength greater inside of you than the strength you possess, you will fail every time. Anybody in here besides me? Yeah. The Bible tells us that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit in you. So when the Bible says he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, it's, it's not saying that God's up there and here, here's us. Well, this is going to be hard with this microphone. Let's do it this way. Okay. It's not like this. It's not like we're down here and, and, man, the temptation and the trials, and we're doing our best, we're doing our best, but, man, they're so heavy. And Satan, he doesn't play fair. By the way, you need to know that Satan doesn't play fair. He doesn't. He cheats, okay? He's messing with you. And, 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 and next thing you know, you got stuff going on in your life, and it's just, it's just stealing the joy of the salvation of God in you, and you're, it's just crushing you and crushing you. Now, listen. A lot of us live like this, that we think God is out there somewhere watching us just get crushed by the weight of temptation and trials and sin. And he's just sitting there cheering for us. Come on, Keith. Come on, buddy. Push up against it. Push up against it. I want to tell you something. When something's too heavy for you, you don't push up against it. It wears you out. God's not out there watching this. He's not. And then, and then right before, we just absolutely are crushed and our spine breaks and our knee joints break and everything breaks and spiritually we're broken. Then God finally comes in and yanks us up by the back of the collar and says, okay, let me get you out of that one. That's not how God works. That's not what this verse is about. This verse is about God knowing you so intimately that he knows exactly where you are in your spiritual experience, in your spiritual maturity. And so he is at work in your life. And even as you're facing trials and temptations, those things, he knows how deep your faith is or how deep your faith isn't. Okay? And he's right there. He's going to watch you. Listen, we don't have time to break into the theology of it, but go to the Old Testament real quick. There's a guy named Job. Who remembers Job? Yeah. Okay. Who's in charge of that whole operation? God, who allowed that whole operation? And why did God not intervene? Because he knew the depth of Job's character. He knew already that the depth of the knowledge that Job already possessed of the character of God and the faithfulness of God, that Job would not, would not turn his back on God. Satan was not convinced of that. So that great thing went on right there. It's so hard for us to understand. But in the end, did Job ever break? No. Was it because of Job's strength? No. It was because of his knowledge of God, his love for God. 
He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, meaning he knows. He knows. Look, do we have any weightlifters in here? How many weightlifters do we have? <laughs> Hunter, why didn't you raise your hand? Okay, I have one hand, just one weight. Do we have anybody in here who has ever lifted weights? Let me put it that way. Who's ever had the experience of situating yourself on a bench press? Lowering that bar. You know, lowering the bar is easy. Has anybody ever noticed that? I mean, it's nothing. You got situated, a little one-inch pull-up, get it off. And then just slowly, you don't even have to bend your arms because the weight's bending your arms for you. And you come down. The hard part is what? Pushing it back up. Have you ever seen somebody that puts too much weight on there? Yeah, what do they have to do? Yeah, they're trapped, aren't they? They've got to holler for help because they made a mistake of not doing what before they started the bench press. Making sure the spotter was right there watching them. I want to tell you something. God is your spotter in life. You don't even have to invite him to come. He's spotting you. He knows what you can handle. He's right there. Okay? This whole verse is about not, not running, for not being afraid of the testing and the temptations and trials of life because God is faithful and he knows you and he knows your ability. He knows where you are spiritually. He's going to be at work. He's right there. He's your spotter in this whole thing. Don't, work, don't, don't be fearful that something's going to crush you because he's right there. He's right there. God's faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. Just real quick. Now, don't even turn there because I've got to go really, really fast. And if you turn all the way back to chapter 1 of this very same letter, listen to this. For the word of the cross... It's folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Same exact word, translated ability, over here in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It's all about the power of God in us. There's a great verse in Philippians 4, 13 that we love to quote. What is it? Through Christ who strengthens me, who is my strength. There's a really great translation of that. Yes, I can deal with the harshness and the, and, the, and the unfairness and the realities of life and the trials and the temptations and the testing if I remember always God has not asked me to do it in my own strength. He is my strength, and I face everything in that strength. So, but with the temptation, he'll provide the way of escape. <laughs> Ekbasen, it's the Greek word. It literally means a way out or a way of egress, a way of clearing Clearing, clearing, clearing from the, the mess or, or enduring something. He'll provide that. You may be able to endure it. So here you go. Time to close up real quick. People ask me a lot of times, especially when, we're doing, when I'm doing discipling and counseling, they say, what, what does that mean, the way of escape? What, what's that, what does the way of escape look like? Well, okay. Um, it is, it's not going to have a, you see that sign right up there over the door? What does that sign say? Okay, so if something happened in here like a fire broke out, we would know that our way of escape was where? Right there. You ever been in a theater where the screen up there says, uh, would you please take notice of the exit signs in the theater so that in case something happens, you'll... Not? Okay, that's the idea of escape. So, but but I, I've never seen an exit sign pop up in front of my face when I'm dealing with temptation or trial. How, what, what are those ways of escape? It's very simple, okay? Just listen really quick. Listen. From a scriptural perspective, calling out the name of Jesus. I don't, I don't know of any better way of escape than in the middle of some testing or trial or temptation that is just stealing joy and that is just weighing down on me to call out. Now, I'm not talking about just in your heart and mind. I mean out loud say, Jesus, Jesus, help. Now, he's not going to have to come from, like, the other side of the universe to help. He's already there. Let me go back to the bench press real quick, okay? A good spotter, a good spotter is going to stand there, but they're going to wait for you to do what? To, to croak out, help. And it, it's about the time that the veins are coming out right here and right here, and the face is red, and the arm's doing this, you know, help. 
Call out the name of Jesus. Second thing is this, speak scripture into the moment. I can't say this enough. I will just tell you, go back and look at the temptations of Jesus uh, out in the desert. Face to face with Satan. He's quoting scripture, quoting scripture, quoting scripture. Man, I've quoted 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I bet you a thousand times, if not more, in my life when I was dealing with some. Bring scripture into it. That's, that's a way of escape. It, 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 it breaks the power of that of that. The, the, the sin, the temptation, the trial, it, it brings a peace that passes all understanding. Reach out to a mature believer. Man, if you're struggling with something, get on the phone. Call somebody that you know is a mature believer in Jesus Christ and say, I need you to come over here. I'm struggling with something, and I'm afraid, I'm afraid that I might be fixing to make a decision I shouldn't make. I need you to come talk to me. There's nothing wrong with that. Alcoholics Anonymous has got down that, that down pat. It's called having a sponsor, somebody that loves you. Enough to talk with you. Resist. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's what the Bible says. And then here's the last one, and we're going to go, I promise. What does a way of escape look like? Well, calling out the name of Jesus, speaking scripture in the moment, reaching out to a mature believer, resisting in the strength of the Spirit. Let me throw this last one out. Run. Run. Not literally run. You remember Joseph, Potiphar's wife, her temptations? What did he do? He ran. He got the heck out of Dodge. He said, this is not a good place to be. There's nobody else in this whole house. I got to get out of here. And he ran. Run. The Bible says flee. In 1 Corinthians 6, 8, flee sexual immorality. In 1 Corinthians 10, 14, the next verse we didn't read. Flee idolatry. 1 Timothy 6, flee the love of money. 2 Timothy 2, flee youthful passions. I mean, run. Sometimes the best thing you can do is run. You're at a social gathering, stuff's going on. You know it's not right. You're being goaded. You're feeling a part of you want to kind of join with the crowd. You're feeling a lot of pressure. You're looking around. Nobody really knows you. They don't know about your witness and your testimony for Christ, and you're kind of playing that game where you say, you know, I can do this, and probably nobody will ever find out. How will they know? How will they know? They'll, they'll know. Trust me, they'll know. But how will they know? And the best thing you can do in that moment is run. Go to your car. Call Uber. Get a taxi, Whatever. Get out of that situation. Run. One of the hardest things that, for me, because I struggle with pride, I may be the only one in this room that struggles with pride, but I do, is coming to grips with this basic truth just based on this one verse, verse 13. God is faithful. He will not allow me to be tempted beyond my experience, my understanding of the power, the ability that he has placed in me by his Holy Spirit. But with whatever is going on with that temptation, he will provide a way of escape that I may be able to endure it. So here's the thing. Every time I mess up, every time I mess up, what does that mean? Does it mean that God didn't come through? Or does it mean I failed to look for the way of escape? God is faithful. It is so hard to look into the face of a faithful, holy, loving God. And say, God, I did not take your way of escape. And I'm here confessing this sin because I chose to get involved with it. That's hard. That's hard. But the Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, you need to memorize it. Write down the card, put it on your refrigerator, in your car, on your desk at work, put it in your heart. And just remember, he is faithful. What you're going through, somebody's already gone through it. He has already shown himself faithful. And he will provide that way of escape. But man, you've got to be looking for it. You've got to be looking for it. And then be willing to take it. Let's stand together. Pray and we'll be dismissed. We're going to small groups. We've got small uh, Bible study groups for all ages. We would invite you to join in with any of those. And um, thank you for being here. Father God, we love you today. Thank you for the way you speak to us in Scripture. And 
I pray by your Holy Spirit you would just graft this truth into our heart. Father, help us to recognize the whole dynamic of, of, of how, we, how we respond to testing and temptation in this world, not in our strength. And Father, you're not asking us to do that in our own strength until we can't do it anymore. You're asking us to respond in the reality of the Holy Spirit and the power that you've already given us. Teach us what that means. Bless every person in here, those watching online, and it's in Jesus' strong name that I pray. Amen.